A little content warning. We get into some descriptions of throwing up in this episode, so if barf's not your jam, keep that in mind when listening. Okay, onwards. I have to give my dog a peanut butter treat so that she doesn't bark the entire time I'm on this call. Which is, what is it? It's the second meetup of the DC Women's Autism Group or something? I don't know. Really good grasp of the details there, Lauren. Anyway, I wanted to dip my toe in the wider autism community and maybe even make some, okay, one autistic friend. And this group seemed like a good enough place for me to start. I mean, I am a D.C. area autistic lady person, so why not see what they're all about? Except there was one snag. I actually hate joining things. Um, But I figure if I don't have to keep my camera on, uh, you know, then uh, I feel more comfortable. Obviously, I'm babbling into my voice memos. But then maybe a lot of people won't turn their cameras on because they feel the same as I do. And then it's like, well, why don't we just have a conference call? Okay, so already I have a bad attitude, mostly born of anxiety. But if I was going to live in the real world and not some fantasy autism Pleasantville, I needed to meet some folks like me. And this group seemed like a low pressure effort at the time. Oh, my God, I'm one minute late. I'm always late, though, so who cares? All right, clicking in. E. We have buses. Yes. At Alexandria, we had the Dash bus. I know there's a bus. When the Zoom screen opened to a bunch of strangers in little squares, folks were already engaging in some idle chit chat about public transit. Right off the bat, I felt squirmy. It's very common among autistic people not to drive. Yes. Very common. Okay, well, I love driving, and my parallel parking skills are beyond reproach. So already I wasn't relating. As a, like, special question for today, what is your favorite thing about the fall as the fall? Oh, God. I don't think I can do this. Like the the red and orange and yellow leaves. I'm done. I think they are beautiful. I can't. Nope. Oh, I can't. I can't do it. Oh. I can't do it. I left the Zoom room without ever talking or showing my face. It was a total bust. I tried. I gave it, what, three minutes before I bailed? It's not terrible. (laughs) It's not great, but I could have not shown up at all, I guess. Here's the thing, though. These types of situations are my private hell, A group where the connection is tenuous because it's based on some sort of broad identity? No, thank you. Like, I don't relate to all gingers just because none of us look good in the color red and we all have to wear long sleeves at the beach. But I was trying to keep an open mind. I really wanted to know autistic people, even if the effort came with a slight cost. But I bailed. Clearly, the cost was higher than I anticipated. Now, I want to be absolutely crystalline. This is not about the group. I'm so glad that it exists and that it provides some kind of comfort and joy and connection to the people who participate. Really, I do. This is not me yucking their yum. This is actually me mad at myself for not getting into it. I'm frustrated that my social anxiety and my fear of joining make it really hard for me to feel like I fit in. Not just here in this Zoom room, but like in life. But if I want other autistic people in my orbit, if I want friends who have this particular shared experience, I'm going to have to get over myself or at least tighten up my friend making skills, plot out a BFF strategy and implement it step by step. So that's what I'm going to do with the assistance of a millennial self-help book a neurodivergent psychiatrist friend, and a handful of willing autistic guinea pigs. But not like pet guinea pigs who are autistic. You know what I mean. You're listening to The Loudest Girl in the World. 
who is not that one drunk lady cheering at the baseball game. It's me, Lauren Ober. The Loudest Girl in the World is a show about finding yourself broken in a pretty dark place and emerging from that place a mostly glued back together person. I'm a person who likes to solve my own problems. For example, recently after some gnarly dental surgery, I figured I could fix the issue of a giant piece of bone protruding from my lower jaw with some $2 orthodontic wax from CVS, rather than take one more useless Tylenol. My girlfriend regularly marvels at my ability to come up with fixes for problems she didn't even know could be solved. What can I say? I'm solutions-oriented. And so it was that I found myself at the main branch of the D.C. Public Library looking for a book on how to make friends. I use my old Dewey Decimal skills here. So I'm like panting, like, what's even wrong with me? Holy hell. What's wrong with me is that I chose to walk up a million stairs, but neglected to remember how monstrously unfit I had become in my dotage. Anyway, I'm going to the psychology and personal growth section. Of the library. I passed a bunch of books with titles like Failure to Launch, Outer Order, Inner Calm, and I really needed this today, Hoda Kotb's Inspirational Words of Wisdom. Then I found what I was looking for. Ah, here we go. Here to Make Friends, How to Make Friends as an Adult by Hope Kelleher, Social Worker. Whoa. All right. I'm, like, almost embarrassed to take this up to the counter and check it out. But only almost. When I got home, I cruised through the book. And here's what I learned. Most people only have between one and five close friends. A quality friendship has many dimensions, like reciprocity, interdependence, emotional intimacy, and conflict resolution. And between the ages of 45 and 55, the number of friends people have seems to plateau. Great. Something to look forward to. One thing the book suggested that I hadn't thought of before was using apps to make new friends, which seems an awful lot like doing a Zoom meetup to me, but worse because it seems desperate. Just the suggestion that I use something called Friended or Friender or Friending, all real apps, to meet a buddy makes my hair curl. Pass. I did the dating apps a million years ago and had about as much success as a toddler trying to read Tolstoy. But maybe the apps would be good for friend making. More one-on-one interaction, no awkward video. So I broke my no apps ever again rule and set up a Bumble BFF account. Okay, it's downloading. Downloading. All right, open. Oh no. This is giving me like flashback PTSD. First, I had to upload some photos, which was totally annoying. I was already over this and I hadn't even gotten into it. I don't need to drag this out. I quit about 32 seconds after starting. Definitely not for me. The profiles were mostly just straight moms looking for friends or activity partners. And I wish them good luck in that. But nary an autistic person to be found. I was starting to feel dispirited. I couldn't join the Zoom group. The friend book didn't really help. And the app route was not my jam. I was never going to make an autistic friend. I was stuck with the neuro tips forever. Unless I called for backup in the form of a narcoleptic psychiatrist slash TV personality who also has ADHD. Dr. Callie to the rescue. That's after the break. My friend Dr. Callie Cyrus is a board certified psychiatrist in private practice. She is also a neurodivergent, queer, black, narcoleptic assistant professor who is often on TV commentating on race, identity, and mental health. Like here on the Showtime show Couples Therapy, where she gently nudges psychoanalyst Orna Goralnik to examine her own racial identity. Can I just ask a question? Has your whiteness been named? 
In what way? Did they ever challenge you about it? No. I want them to. Ooh, spicy. Callie's a good pal of mine, and helping people fix their problems is part of her job. So I figured I could ask her to solve all my crap for me. Well, really just one thing. Callie, I need, um, I need to find autistic friends who are like me, who are my age, and I need your help. Can right. you help me? I can try. You can try. <laughs> I can try. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever had anyone ask you to help them find friends before? Um, I, I can't say that I've had someone say, help me find autistic friends before like me. Right. Yes, but I have gotten before. I need some friends. that They may not have really? phrased it in that way, yeah. So you are not unfamiliar with the strife and struggle of humans needing connection, a.k.a. friends. Right, but this is a special request, I will say. So. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? I'm special. As anyone who is over the age of 23 knows, it's hard to make friends as an adult. It's especially hard when you're out of practice and you're looking for a needle in a haystack. In my case, middle-aged autistic people who are not men, but also who like dogs and loud talkers and don't mind endless conversations about perimenopause or my upstairs neighbor's midday karaoke habits. Before Dr. Kelly could help me, she wanted to know a crucial bit of information— why did I want to make an autistic friend so badly? I could understand why you'd want to find a friend like you, but what do you want to talk to them about that you can't talk to other people about? Is it just kind of say? Okay, that's a really good yeah. question. I've been thinking about this myself, and I, I think it's like a comfort thing. I have gone through my entire life in what I would categorize as a, like a non-autistic way. I mm -hmm. I don't know anybody who is autistic um except for, you know, my girlfriend's son. Um I'm sure I have engaged with autistic people many times and just not known it. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like my close friends or even my my wider circle of acquaintances, to the extent that anyone knows anyone's neurology, right. uh, I don't think any of them are autistic. And that feels weird in a way that I think it would feel weird if I was, like, gay and didn't know any gay people. Okay, well, in case you're just tuning in, newsflash, I am gay. And I do know loads of gay people. And being friends with people like me makes my life feel more complete— in a world where I often feel like an interloper, having that familiarity is critical. I explained it to Callie in a different way. I'm from Pittsburgh, so I don't need to know people from Pittsburgh to make my way through the world. Right. But every time I meet someone from Pittsburgh, it's like I immediately feel like comforted around them. We have a similar understanding of accent, of a language, yeah. of a sports team, of a whatever. But there's another reason why making an autistic friend or 12 is really important to me. Autism for me doesn't feel normalized unless it's sort of a part of your everyday life. But right now, it's not a part of my everyday. In that, I haven't told that many people. So it's mostly just a diagnosis that lives in my head along with the lyrics to salt and Peppa Shoop, my running list of puppy names, and deep regrets over that cross-country road trip I didn't take when I was 22. But Dr. Callie says it's the lack of disclosure that makes it hard to connect with people like me. It's kind of like dating right. in this way, right? Like you're looking for someone to set you up on a blind date to think of you the next time maybe they know somebody or even if if, if it's them I, and I, and you can either right. try to look for your future friend in real life or on <laughs> on the internet right and so some of that means some level of public disclosure um right. because this is you know more of a private thing so you're gonna have to try to attract you know what you're oh looking for oh my god oh but putting myself out there is hard why can't I just accidentally happen upon a whole trove of autistic friends while I'm out walking my dog or something? The best scenario would be like if you were out doing something you would normally be doing, let's say it's not coronavirus, and you met someone who also happened to be autistic, which is like right. I don't know how you would find out in that way because you're not wearing a badge of like, we don't just wear I'm going to though. Identities. 
No, hey. now we're. I'm going to. I'm going to wear pins. I'm going to uh, wear so many. I'm going to be like, I'm autistic. Uh, hey. What's, what's What's your name? Okay, badge pin idea, not so great. I think I just need to get my disclosure on to find people who are like me. But Dr. Callie said exercise some caution. I believe that there is a way to disclose that is professionally or personally responsible and aligned with whatever your boundaries are. Okay, so this gives me this gives me hope that I might be able to make an autistic friend, but I really just have to I have to put myself out there. Yes. If you build right. it, they will come. <laughs> great, great. Yeah. I'll just embody Kevin Costner. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'll just walk out of an Iowa cornfield being like, I'm autistic. And then all of a sudden people will just be like flocking to me. Yeah. Hey, right. I'm telling you, that's how it works. <laughs> but before I jumped from the autism kiddie pool to the deep end, I wanted to create a cheat sheet of sorts for myself so I wasn't just flailing about. Luckily, girlfriend Hannah had just the thing I was looking for. We met up to talk about it over lunch. I think you're sitting, like, too close to me right now. Okay. Just, like, we don't have to touch while you're sitting okay. next to me. Okay. Are you wearing a mock turtleneck? Okay, no, I'm not. Stop touching me. If, oh. you, if I can't touch you, then... Fine. Okay, fine. If Hannah pulled out a folder with a sheaf of paper stuffed right, inside. Right, right. Okay. So this is the thing I wanted to show you. Um, right, which which it, is... It's a, it's a pretty well-known program called Peers. Yeah. And it's a program that Jacob and I did together right before the pandemic. Jacob, Hannah's middle child, and my favorite autistic teen. Basically, it's a pretty intense program, and it, it's like a very specific breakdown of how to make friends, and it's designed for teens. And it's, Which I am not. Which you are not. But aren't you? What? We all have like an internal age, you know? And my internal age is 75, thank you. The handouts from Jacob's class broke down how to make friends into the tiniest steps. They might seem obvious to most folks, but autistics are not most folks. I, I'm so First of all, it's like identifying where sources of friends might be. So it's basically like, where do they live? Where do they exist? Where do they show up? And then it's like, then how do you enter into that, the, the source? Like, how do you jump in that stream? How do you jump into the stream? And then how do you maintain a conversation so the conversation doesn't go like this? I like your green sweater. Thank you. That right there is what we would call a conversation ender. Good thing Hannah took so many notes on the strategies to avoid that happening in the future. Say like, look at my notes here. It's like, oh, I can't even read your hand right Conversation. Have a prop ready so that you a can. A prop? Talk. Yes. Like a cane they, or like a top hat. I would 100% advocate that Hannah dump me after this exchange. But there were a lot of good reminders in the worksheets about how to comport yourself around people you might want to be friends with. Ask the other person about themselves. Find common interests. Share the conversation. Don't be a conversation hog. Don't be an interviewer. Don't get too personal at first. Assess interest. There are for sure a few of those that I struggle with. I'm going to let you guess which ones. After the break, I'm going to take all this info and I'm going to use it to put myself out there and see who shows up. Just kidding. I'm going to be a reporter and call up cool autistic people and see if any of them want to be my friend. It's one of the perks of working in media, asking interesting folks to talk to you. And damn it, I'm going to use it. What do you think I was going to do? Stand on the sidewalk wearing a sandwich board that read, I'm autistic, are you? I mean, I did consider it. After trying and failing with the Autistic Lady Zoom and the Make a Friend app, I figured I needed to get more strategic. With my Dr. Callie conversation in my head and the Autistic Teen worksheets at my fingertips, I came up with a few rules to help guide my approach. Rule number one. Find things in common to talk about. Catherine May is the New York Times bestselling author of Wintering, The Power of Rest and Retreat in Difficult Times. During the pandemic, I, like half the people I know, read this book. It was a real beacon in the perpetual bleakness that was COVID times. 
In reading that book, one of the things I learned was that Catherine was autistic. Well, shit, that's exciting. Of course, upon uncovering that, I had to know everything about her. One crucial detail about Catherine is that before she wrote Wintering, she published a memoir about learning she was autistic. It's called The Electricity of Every Living Thing. And you should pause this episode and go order a copy right now. It's that good. Naturally, I wanted to be best friends with her. So I called her up at her home in Kent in the UK and just went for it. I'm curious about the initial process of thinking about autism or kind of diagnosing yourself. Like I know in the book, it became like a compulsive um, uh, job of like, I need to hoover up all the information about this. Yeah, I think that's a really common experience having talked to other late diagnosed autistics, actually, that you become totally obsessed with hoovering. Like it it was this moment of recognition for me. I was driving in my car and I heard a woman on the radio talk about being autistic herself. And genuinely, you know, like I was 39 years old. It was the first time I'd ever heard an autistic woman speak about her experiences. And I immediately recognised myself. There was just there was just no shadow of a doubt in my mind. Like I felt this immediate contact with her. And it was on one hand quite thrilling and on the other hand, completely terrifying and unknown. And like, you know, did I want to carry this label? What would it mean? What does it mean about me? You know, the whole big cloud of of thought and fear, (laughs) you know, anxiety. Oh my God, same, we're twins. I wanted to talk to you about your temper as a kid and mm. and and I guess like what that looked like when you were a child. Yeah, um, I was, mm. you know, seen as a, a child with a temper who could kind of fly off the hand on, who was was naughty and difficult. And I believed that about myself. And so that's what I've kind of overwritten my memory with, you know, and so... To to see it now as like an autistic child who was meeting moments of social and sensory overwhelm and was therefore mentally collapsing um, in the way that, you know, we're really familiar with understanding that autistic kids do now and adults, but, you know, probably more, more visibly children. I find it hard to unravel and to go back to what those triggers were for me. You know, they've they've mm. kind of vanished in time. And what I remember is being disapproved of by adults for losing control and feeling Mm -hmm. very different in that sense like very very much like a like somebody who was who did not have control of their behavior in the way that other children did and and wondering how other children managed to pull off this amazing feat of, of control okay it was clear that Catherine may and i were destined for best friend necklaces oprah and gail move over We had empathy. We had things in common, like anger and meltdowns. We were on the express train to Paltown. So I had to ask, Will you be my autistic friend? (laughs) Yes, yes. This is so great. I'm so glad you said yes, because it'd be really awkward if you said no. (laughs) Autistic friend making level one unlocked. But then I made it weird by following up our chat with an email saying I was going to fly to the UK so we could do a ramble in the countryside. Like a good Brit, Catherine politely declined. Rule number two for how to make a friend. Show some vulnerability. Now, normally I'm allergic to the V word. But sharing is caring, right? Pip Brown is an electro-pop singer-songwriter from Aotearoa, New Zealand, known as Lady Hawk. Hey, I'm Lady Hawk. Um, Or you can call me Pip. Fun fact, Pip composed all the original music for the series. So if you like what you hear, give Lady Hawk's tunes a whirl. But Pip is other things besides a musician. She's a prolific gamer, a parent, and for our purposes, an autistic soon-to-be friend. Did you ever have a clue you're like, because you felt like you were a little bit weird, a little bit different, then you found music and it was a relief, but did you sense like, like there's something else? Yeah. Yeah. There was that feeling for me. And when I was living in Melbourne, I was struggling a lot with 
going outside. I was struggling with like getting on public transport to go to my job, which was I worked at a bar. And I remember thinking to myself, this shouldn't be this hard for a person. Other people don't find it that hard to walk out their front door and like get on a tram. But for me, I I had the cyclical thoughts in my head of everything that could go wrong in the time that I stepped out of the door and hopped onto the tram. So for me, my biggest fear has always been the unpredictability of other people. And I hate getting on um, like public transport and not knowing what's going to happen because strangers are just like crazy, instantly crazy to me. I'm like, anyone could do anything at any point. Pip is doing an excellent job in the vulnerability department. Clearly, she knows how this friend-making thing works. So I hopped on a tram. I really, really mentally worked myself up to it. I was like sweating and I felt sick. I was like, I'm nauseous, I'm nauseous. And I was sitting there and this like junkie couple hopped on the the next stop and instantly the chick just puked on the ground. And I went... And that's my worst, that's like my worst nightmare. Like you couldn't put me in a worse situation. And I was like, ah. <laughs> I was having a meltdown and like had to get off the tram. And I called my girlfriend at the time and I was like, I'm off the tram. Come, come get me. Help me. A junkie puked. <laughs> like so, that was. Um, I'm, I'm laughing so much because this is like, this is exactly my feeling like I feel you on this so hard because like any kind of erratic behavior is very stressful to me so like me too so this is gonna sound totally nuts but just bear with me like I have a real I have almost like a phobia of particular birds because birds are like unpredictable birds will come like flap at you like I got attacked by a turkey once and it was like holy shit like what is happening yeah yeah and I'm fearful that the thing is gonna impact me like what's happening I'm fearful that it's gonna happen on me oh yeah well you don't want to get barfed on (laughs) I don't want to get barfed on or pooped on or like all the things I've seen happen you know I had a massive well you wouldn't know this but like my social anxiety when I was a kid up and through probably uh, college was like that I would throw up in public and I would make myself so nervous about the idea. And because I was anxious about that, I would get a stomach ache and the stomach ache would say to me, oh, you're going to throw up in public. So, so I would have to like sit out, like I'd be all ready to go for like Halloween trick or treating and then feel super anxious, feel like I was going to throw up and then have to sit it out. And I never puked ever. I never did. You've just described my entire childhood. That exact thing was my thing. And I always would work myself up to the point where I felt nauseous. And then I'd be like, I'm going to puke. I'm going to puke. I'm going to puke. I'm going to puke. And I'd be like, please don't puke. Please don't puke. Oh my God. I would never puke. And I'd always have to get sent home from school as well. Like, it'd be like, I can't, I can't do this class. I'm, I feel sick. I feel sick. I'm going to be sick. And right, like, right. It was just like, was awful. And it, it followed me around for years, that shit. Oh like. my God, me too. I don't tell many people that stuff because it's weird. Like bird and barf phobias, really? But I shared some of my vulnerabilities and it turns out Pip has them too. Well, not the bird thing. That's all me. But still, I feel like we could be moving to best friend zone. Oh, I have one last question. Um, Do you want to be my autistic friend? Yes. Yes. (laughs) I'm in. I'm in. Mm, Did I sense a slight hesitation in Pip's voice? Maybe. She's probably worried I will exhibit unpredictable behavior if we ever meet in real life. And she would be right to be concerned. According to the Autistic Teen Worksheet, one of the most important skills in friend-making is that when you are in conversation with someone, you reflect back what the other person has told you. You don't shift the conversation back to you and your story. This approach to friendship might be obvious, but it's something I actively struggle with, mostly because I use my own experience as a way to empathize with people. But that can take you out of someone else's story. By the way, this is me being vulnerable with you. Do you want to be friends now? I thought so. (laughs) 
So, my final rule. Be a reflective listener. Chelsea Wolf is a professional BMX rider in San Diego, and a pretty excellent one at that. She was an alternate to represent the U.S. in the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Chelsea is also one of the very few out-trans action sports athletes. From a young age, Chelsea was into just about everything with wheels. Jeeps, remote-controlled cars, but bikes stole her heart. There's something so fascinating and beautiful about the bicycle and how it's just a simple but also complex piece of machinery that can be fine-tuned to just create beautiful music of riding, basically. And just the uh, the different styles of bikes and construction, they're just, they're very fascinating. Her obsession with bikes was one of the reasons she suspected she might be autistic. Probably one of my longtime special interests is just bikes and bike knowledge. I worked as a mechanic for like nine years and uh, there's just so many things to learn about such a simple thing. But then socially as well, like the freedom that bicycles provide of just freedom of motion and their involvement in various liberation movements throughout history. Um, Bicycles are a very special thing to me. I feel you like I'm smiling the whole way through as you're talking because I feel the same way. I mean, you know, I was. okay. so I'm shifting back to me. Not really reflective listening, Lauren. Let's try again. Did you get a formal autism diagnosis or did you sort of self-identify, self-diagnose and and when did that happen for you? I um I kind of always knew there was something. Um my older brother was diagnosed as autistic at a very young age. Very typical, you know, the boy gets diagnosed and the girl is ignored. Um, So it wasn't until a couple of years ago, actually, that when the pandemic started, all of those supports kind of fell apart. And I had to start spending time with myself, that I started to really have to figure out like, what is it that makes me tick? How do I learn how to function again without the supports that I used to have? Um, So it was during the year of 2020, like that was when I sought out and got a diagnosis. But I went my entire life just thinking that there was something wrong with me, rather than realizing like, oh, this, this particular thing about me is because of the autism. Like, I just thought it was like like a character flaw. (laughs) That's interesting that you had a sibling who was on the spectrum and was diagnosed. And Like, I mean, were there similarities between you where you were like, oh, he has that. I'm a little bit like that. Absolutely. And that's the thing that blows my mind that I don't understand how I wasn't diagnosed sooner is like almost all of the things that got him his diagnosis, like the various traits that were noticed and picked up on by the adults. I had the same thing, but instead of being like, oh, wow, like you might be autistic too. Let's take you to a professional and figure this out. It was like, why are you doing that thing? And I would get in trouble for it and be criticized. It's like, what? (laughs) And it's it's really funny too, with like at the time, my parents wouldn't have had any reason to suspect that I wasn't a boy, just like my older brother. And yet my experiences, even in that time, is more closely aligned with experiences of femme people and women who are autistic being overlooked and having our needs neglected because the way that they are perceived. That is so interesting. Isn't it? Like like in your brain, in your soul, in all of the parts that matter, you're identifying as female. And so that is how your brain works. And you are probably doing all of the sort of stereotypical like masking, camouflaging, like all of that kind of stuff. I don't know. I mean, it's so it's also complicated and interesting and weird. And like our brains are so bizarre. This is all going very well, I think. Now, you know what I have to ask Chelsea. I want to know, will you be my autistic friend? I would love to be your autistic friend. (laughs) Yes. Yes, I'm in. I'm in. This is great. The best friends. Like, you know how there's always like growing up, there's that just disconnect of like you don't understand 
why you don't connect with your peers, but you know that you don't and you just feel like an outcast. Autistic friends are the opposite. It's like, you don't understand why you have that connection, but you just fit in. It works so well. So yes, totally. autistic friends are the best. <laughs> Fantastic. So if I ever, if I ever come out to uh, San Diego. Talking to all these great autistic women and gently forcing my friendship on them was so inspiring and heartening. It's such a lovely feeling to know that you are part of a clan that you have kin beyond the people who raised you. These women made me feel like I'm not alone. I felt like they got me and I got them. And the importance of that can't be underestimated. We all want to feel seen and have our experiences reflected back to us in a friendly face or a kind word or a light touch. Just kidding, light touches are the worst. For me, just knowing that people like Catherine and Pip and Chelsea exist, as well as Dr. Callie, who is autism adjacent, makes stepping into this new identity seem a little less terrifying. I feel more sure of myself after talking with them, like I can accomplish anything, which is good because I have a big task ahead of me. At this point in my journey, I've passed through the outer rings with my disclosures, I've told friends, acquaintances, and total strangers. But now it's time to let in the innermost ring, the ring with the highest stakes. It's time to tell my family. You've been listening to The Loudest Girl in the World. It's hosted, written, and executive produced by me, Lauren Ober. Our senior producer is Ryder Alsop. Our associate producer is David Ja. Sophie Crane is our showrunner and senior editor. Jake Gorski is our mix engineer. Music composed by my autistic Kiwi pal, the inimitable Lady Hawk. Our artwork was created by the autistic illustrator Loretta Ipsum. The show was fact checked by Andrea Lopez Cruzado, and our autism consultant is Sarah Caput. Our executive producers are Mia Lobel and Lital Molad. Big thanks to my pal, Dr. Callie Cyrus, for her time and expertise. You can find her online at CallieDCMD.com. That's Callie, K-A-L-I. Super special thanks to all my new autistic best friends, Catherine May, Pip Brown, and Chelsea Wolfe. Check them out in all the places. And thanks to you, friend, for listening.